So tonight, we're going to talk more about um, artistic mm. craftsmanship and things, yeah, mm. soul collage craft. and that sort of stuff. Um, Sandy's been here one time before that Bill missed. Mm. But first of all, I'm going to share, um, you know, Dr. Young was very clear and um, Professor Brucha, whose essay I sent you, Everybody uh -huh. got the essay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, I got it. <laughs> so, everybody's very clear that you have to communicate with your soul. And that means, um, that means doing something creative. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, you can also a bit communicate with the soul by um, reading. Okay, so for example, I know, um, you know, my mother-in-law will sit for weeks at a time, literally, in her apartment. I mean, she lives in the same building as we do, and I won't see her but once a week because she's, she's uh, holed up reading books, and she's a former librarian, and that has always been her love, and so she lived in a very tough environment, okay, which was northern Maine, Presque Isle, Maine, which is like north of Quebec, okay? I mean, Presque Isle is north yeah. of Quebec, okay? <laughs> and, and, um... It's a good place to read. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, right. that's right. What else are you going to do? <laughs> well, and, and there are a lot of potato farms up there and, and a paper factory where her father worked. Um, and she became a librarian, okay? And she did that her whole life, aside from raising two children, my wife being one. And so she feeds her soul. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is I'm, I'm working with a, um, a quote from the Red Book, which is called, which says, my friends, it is wise to nourish the soul Otherwise, you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. Okay, so uh, anyway, she, that's how she does it. But, you know, you can do it by playing music. You can do it by painting or writing, which is what Bill does. You can do it by uh, creating a, a YouTube channel or a website, which is the things I've been doing. But I've always been interested in calligraphy, so I started to just teach myself about three and a half months ago, and I like that quote, so I decided I'm going to try to figure out how to do that quote in a calligraphy kind of way, and so what I'm going to do is show you the progression of what I've done, okay? I finally decided that what I have to do is I have to do the pictures that I'm putting the calligraphy around first. I can't do the writing and then put the pictures in. So the first one is this, okay, dragons and devils. And you see I stuck the I stuck the horn of the devil up through the top of the D. And uh, and I've made a lot of mistakes, so you have to accept that when you're starting something, you're going to be, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. So I'm just going to show you all my mistakes first. And here I made the, the devil too big, and I have him eating the heart. Okay, which is, um, I can pass these around if you want. But I'm trying to figure out how to set it up on the page. So these are early attempts and early attempts at drawing a devil and a, and a dragon. So this dragon is too little and this devil is, his horns are too weird. <laughs> and then um, I started to improve, but I still goof these up. But you have to be willing to make all these mistakes first, right? Because you start to get there and I'm, I'm gradually closing in on it in these different images because I'm seeing... Nourish the soul, otherwise you will breathe? 
you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. Right. My friends, it is wise to nourish the soul. And I thought this one would be good, but then I sort of, I didn't like the devil's horns here. So I, uh, I decided to kank this one too. But it's starting to get there. Um, and then I got even closer with this one. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, I made the dragon too big and the devil too big, so it doesn't all fit on the page yet. All you got to do is scan the annex. Okay, look down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so, so the very latest it, version. Then put it in your, you know, page So the very lo pages. latest version of it is this. Mm. Okay, where you can see I put some lines on the page, but I and I started the dragon, but I haven't done anything else. But, um, but the point is, what I found as I started to do this calligraphy and. Most people that have followed me the last couple of months know that I'm doing calligraphy. Uh, is that it's uh, it's just a terrific meditation technique because you have to focus, <laughs> and uh, so for that reason I'm uh, in, in doing that and enjoying. Now, for my followers out here who don't know. Um, the advanced reading group has completed Mysterium Conjunctionis, if you don't know. So we did 45 seminars on Mysterium, and we had previously done 32 seminars on Ion. And so we decided to take something a little uh, lighter this time. <laughs> so we took uh, the spirit in man, art, and literature which is volume, thir uh, volume 15 of the collected the works. Volume. Pardon? The last volume. No, no. Oh, the one. last volume is 20. I mean, the last real volume is 18, but uh, which is... The uh, uh, symbol or something like that. I forget. But anyway, the, this is volume 15, and it has some raucous essays in it. And, yeah, I've right, and and so this week we're doing Ulysses, and so if you're if you're interested in starting in the advanced reading group, now's your chance to start, and we're starting on page 109, <laughs> and all these bit books are available electronically in the YouTube um, in the Dropbox, and if you don't have a Dropbox membership, write to skip.com over a Gmail. Dot com and I'll pull you in uh, so you can see what I'm reading and uh, but anyway I, there's parts of it he's talking about James Joyce's Ulysses and uh, yes, yes. pardon yes <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, and so it begins with a raucous part, um, and, and so I just read it to you, just to share. <laughs> it's so funny. And, and also, are you familiar with Molly Bloom's soliloquy? You're not? Oh my god. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, you must look up the soliloquy of Molly Bloom, which has been recited by several very virtuoso Irish actresses. So they've really done a wonderful job. And in order to do it justice, it's a 40-page run-on sentence, which, which is the end of Ulysses. Okay, it's the end of Ulysses. But um, various people in the early 1930s were after Jung because he was a psychologist to say, you know, what are we to make of this Ulysses? And of course, Ulysses was uh, banned in the United States as pornography. And it was, um, well, you'll see. <laughs> but it's really the day, in the, the day, a day in the life of Leopold Bloom, which is Bloom's Day, June the 16th, 2004. That's the day. 
And so basically all James Joyce does is describe going through the day with Leopold Bloom, who's, a, who's Jewish. And so here's, um, here's Jung beginning his like 25 page monologue on Ulysses. I'm only going to read one page. So the Ulysses of my title has to do with James Joyce and not with that shrewd and storm-driven figure of Homer's world who knew how to escape by guile and wily deeds the en enmity and vengeance of gods and men and who after a wearisome voyage returned to hearth and home. Joyce's Ulysses very much unlike his ancient namesake, is a passive, merely perceiving consciousness, a mere eye, ear, nose, and mouth, a sensory nerve exposed without choice or check to the roaring, chaotic, lunatic cataract of psychic and physical happenings, and registering all this with almost photographic accuracy. Ulysses is a book that pours along for 735 pages, a stream of time 735 days long, which all consists in one single and senseless day in the life of every man, the completely irrelevant 16th of June, 1904, in Dublin, a day on which, in all truth, nothing happens. <laughs> 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 the stream begins in the void and ends in the void. Uh, is all this perhaps one single immensely long and excessively complicated Stringbergian pronouncement upon the essence of human life? A pronouncement which, to the reader's dismay, is never finished. Is never finished? That it has a question mark. Is never finished? Possibly it does touch upon the essence, but quite certainly it reflects life's 10,000 facets and their 100,000 gradations of color. So far as I can see, there are in those 735 pages no ob obvious repetitions, not a single blessed island <laughs> with the long suffering. Not a single blessed island where the long-suffering reader can come to rest. No place where he can seat himself, drunk with memories, and contemplate with satisfaction the stretch of war road he has covered, be it 100 pages or even less. If only he could spot some little commonplace that had obligingly slipped in again where it was not expected. But no, the pitiless stream rolls on without a break, and its velocity or viscosity increases in the last 40 pages till it sleep sweeps away even the punctuation marks. Here the suffocating emptiness becomes so unbearably tense that it reaches the bursting point. This utterly hopeless emptiness is the dominant note of the whole book. It not only begins and ends in nothingness, it consists of nothing but nothing. <laughs> but nothing. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> it is all infernally nugatory. As a piece of technical virtuosity, it is a brilliant and hellish monster birth. <laughs> okay, so then, um, just for further giggles, I'm going to read the end of this essay, which is uh, re refers to, well, actually, it's not the end. It's a, it's a letter, the cover letter that Jung wrote to James Joyce when he sent his review. Okay, he says, uh, James Joyce, Esquire, Hotel Elite, Zurich, Dear Sir, your Ulysses has presented the world such an upsetting psychological problem that repeatedly I have been called in as a supposed authority on psychological matters. Ulysses proved to be an exceedingly hard nut, and it has forced my mind not only to f most unusual efforts, but also to rather extravagant peregrinations, speaking from the standpoint of a scientist. Your book as a whole has given me no end of trouble and I was brooding over it for about three years until I succeeded to put 
myself into it. Uh, but I must tell you that I'm profoundly grateful to yourself, as well as to your gigantic opus, because, because I learned a great deal from it. I shall probably never be quite sure whether I did enjoy it because it meant <laughs> because it meant too much grinding of nerves and of gray matter. I also don't know whether you will enjoy what I have written about Ulysses because I couldn't help telling the world how much I was uh, how much I was bored, how I grum <laughs> how I grumbled how I cursed and how I admired. The 40 pages of non-stop -stop run in the end is a string of veritable psychological peaches. I suppose the devil's grandmother knows so much about the real psychology of a woman. I didn't. <laughs> well, I just try to recommend my little essay to you as an amusing attempt of a perfect stranger who went astray in the labyrinth of your Ulysses and happened to get out of it. <laughs> happened to get out of it again by sure good luck. <laughs> At all of the events, you may gather from my article that what Ulysses, what Ulysses has done to a supposedly balanced psychologist <laughs> With the expression of my deepest appreciation, I remain, dear sir, yours faithfully, C.G. Young. <laughs> Young's copy of Ulysses contains on its flyleaf the following inscription in Joyce's hand to Dr. C.G. Young, with great grateful appreciation to his aide and counsel, James Joyce, at Christmas 1934, Zurich. The copy is evidently the one that Young owned when he wrote the essay, as some of the passages quoted therein have been marked in pencil. And uh, let's see. And anyway, um, James Joyce uh, requested, it, you know, the publisher sent it to Joyce and uh, asked what he thought about it. <laughs> and, and Joyce says, hang it low, which it was, uh, I don't know, Frederick the Great or somebody, some Austrian emperor who wanted all, all of the criticisms of him hung low so that everybody could see them. And uh, at one point, we're, we're talking about James Joyce and, and uh, Ulysses, Jung's criticism of that. And uh, you may, if you like, uh, look at, let's see, look at what we, you missed, but um, I'm not going to do it again. Uh, so start, start at the bottom, start, start at the bottom of page 133. That's Jung's letter about it. But um, Joseph brought his daughter to see Jung because she was a schizophrenic, and he had told her that um, he, had, he had told Joyce about his daughter that she's drowning in the sea in which you swim. Okay, because basically Joyce was bringing out what was in his unconscious and, uh, and his daughter couldn't cope with the material that was coming out, but Joyce could swim in it, right? So, comments, Bill? No, no, no. <laughs> I, no I'm just uh, in which he slams, but it, it, is he engaging her in such a way that she's having to swim with him? Mm. Yeah, I think that was part of it. Mm -hmm. I have a sense that that, it, that was the case. Did he, and did he have a wife or anyone else that might be bearing the yeah, uh, <laughs> the load? James Joyce. <laughs> Had uh, a woman that lived with him. Yes, a mistress. Mrs. Yeah. Miss Barnacle was yeah. it? But the daughter, daughter was carrying the load. But the daughter was carrying the load. Unfair. And why? And How why? Old? It's interesting. Huh? What was the age of the daughter? Oh, I don't know. Okay. When, when she went to see Jung, I think okay. she was in her early pictures, 20s. Yeah, pictures I've seen of her, she's in her 20s. Hmm. Yeah. I don't and know I, that she finished her life, I think. She, 
I don't, I don't, I don't remember. remember. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't remember. And of course, Joyce wrote Finnegan's Way afterward. That's a, that's a labor. <laughs> yeah, Finnegan's <laughs> Way. Now, if you're going to read Finnegan's Way, I do urge you to get a book by Joseph Campbell called mm. The Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake, mm. because Joseph Campbell, especially the first eight pages, he, he uh, opens up all the layers that, that James Joyce is referring to, because Joyce has layered myth on myth on myth <coughs> on myth so deep that unless you're just a... Mm a multiple PhD a theologian, theologian <laughs> etc. you're not going to understand it. And um, do you know what the fundamental fact of Finnegan's no. Wake is? Do you, Bill? Not that I recall. Do you remember? No. Okay, well the fun fundamental fact is that it begins with the end of a sentence. Hmm. Okay. And it ends with the beginning of the same uh, sentence. Hmm. And so you can get to the end and read the beginning of the sentence and mm -hmm. go back to the beginning and right. read on. And, and um, mm. it's basically about the round of life. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's the fundamental thing if you don't get lost in the labyrinth. <laughs> and that isn't the one he was talking about, <laughs> what I just read to you. Yes. Okay. And it's interesting how he fits in with the other mystical uh, poet, Eliot. Yeah. Elliot was similar in, a, in that you basically had to have a scholarly Approach. assortment of <laughs> yeah. references laying around. Yeah, so I also wanted but to mention... But a little easier to read, I think. Yeah. I also wanted to mention that uh, Edward Edinger did a talk on Faust. Okay, this is Faust. And uh, it's about an hour and 15 minute talk. It, they don't have video of it, so the the YouTube thing just has a picture of Edinger for the whole time, but you have the audio. Mm -hmm. And um, he broke Faust down into ten parts, which is very interesting. But what, one of the key things that he referred to is this version of Faust, okay? And so let me just show you. So this is Faust by Norton Library. Is that yes? It's from uh, no Norton Critical Edition. It's a Norton Critical Edition, second edition, and it's translated by Walter Arndt and edited by Cyrus Hamlin. And one of the significant things about it is that they're interpretive notes of Faust. And I had bought a book on tape that was a performance of the play, but I'm sure it didn't have everything in it because um, the, yeah, the play itself runs to 12,110 12, lines. So the three hour thing that I got on audible.com was a hugely abbreviated mm -hmm. version of it, right? And so here we are. That split, this is the end of the book, is longer than the play itself, and that's the <laughs> interpretive notes, which is why, which is why uh, Edinger gave us that, and among other things, it has very interestingly in this a um, a uh, critique by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, mm. which is very interesting, <laughs> and, um, and not positive, I might add. He basically says that it was... Uh, Faust is not his personal myth, like it was. Right, young. so uh, Faust is to Emerson as Joyce was to Young, I think. <laughs> He didn't think it was very poetic, but maybe he also uh, didn't read German. Yeah. Okay, so he didn't, couldn't read it in the poetic version. But this is the version that you want uh, from well, Amazon. With the esteem that the Germans hold. Uh, with Faust looking at, the, at this 
flash of light, mm. which is Mephistopheles, of course. Mm. You know, Goethe. Uh, well, never mind. <laughs> Goethe what? No. Okay. And today, I'm very pleased to say that I had a little extra money this week, which was very nice. So I finally got myself a copy of Psychology and Religion, East and West. Um, West and East, I'm sorry. You bought that out of the trunk of a car out there, didn't you? Yeah, which is volume 11 of the collected works. I thought I had bought it once before, but then I realized that what I got was an abbreviated version. There's an abbreviated version on... Amazon that you can buy for like 30 bucks mm -hmm. and I thought okay that's the paperback version I get that right it turned out that version was only the Terry lectures which was mm -hmm. like five lectures that Jung gave at some point which are in this book mm -hmm. but this book was cost me 110 bucks today um, and it among other things it does include answer to joke so mm -hmm. <coughs> so uh Paragraphs 553 to 758 of this volume is Answer to Joe, which you can buy separately, of course. But I'm thrilled with it because, among other things, it's, um, it has a number of very interesting essays in it, which I'm going to be commenting on in the near future. I mean, you wouldn't find the essays of anywhere else other than this book. That was well, the Terry this. lectures are in here, right. uh, but they're a small portion of it. And so the way it's presented on Amazon, I thought I was getting volume 11, mm -hmm. but it wasn't that. So let's see here. Uh, well, I can't find it right offhand, which were the essays that were the Terry Lectures, but in any case, the Terry Lectures are in here, but they're like 20% of it or something, and, and uh, so the other, the other key ones, and apparently the really key one, which I haven't gotten into, which is Transformation of Symbolism in the Mass, that's one, um, and then... Um, of course, Answer to Job is in there, but we've talked about that. Psychology and religion, and uh, psychological approach to the dogma of the Trinity, which is uh, 100 pages of it. So it's all going to be very interesting to talk about, but I'll pass it around so you can see. <coughs> and um, So anyway. Did anybody get a chance to look at this essay, which is in tonight's reading is from the Red Book for our time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, Volume 3, and the essay is by Paul Brucha. Uh, I have put it in the Dropbox but, and made it available to you. So why'd you choose this one? Uh, I just thought it was very... Um, Powerful. I have a quote of myself here. I I wrote a quote above the <laughs> above the essay. So the quote of myself is: "You must create something always. Uh, watching TV or going to a religious service is living vicariously someone else's life, and such things are designed and intended to keep you docile until you are dead." So like the Super Bowl yesterday, I mean, it, w it was so uninteresting that I, I couldn't even look up at it. I mean, I told Debbie this evening as I was leaving the house, I didn't see a single one of the ads last night um, in the Super Bowl. I just, well, it's, as somebody said to me, it's my billionaire against yours. interesting development that's happened in Catholic liturgical life uh -huh. since 1928, which says you cannot fully be present at a religious service unless you are 
actively, consciously participating. Consciously listening and absorbing and uh, actively doing whatever verbal responses are and physical responses that there are. I mean, basically the church was saying, you're not there, you're not mm -hmm. part of it, mm -hmm. if you're not actually participating and sharing in it. In the ceremony. In the ceremony. In the ritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot to that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of variability in that too. Pardon? Yes, there is a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because a lot of churches will shut you out so that you remain docile, mm -hmm. as you say. Yeah. But, but then what? I mean, so you cannot, when you said you cannot, you're ta I'm talking, the, we're talking to the clergy or talking to the people? The people. The, the, the letter was written to the people to uh -huh. say you cannot admit to having been at a religious service mm. from now on unless you fully, actively, and consciously participate. It's also a bit presumptuous. It is. Because it, it, it puts them in a position of being, I'm your connection to God. Mm -hmm. Right. And well, without me there, you know, and assuming they're all, the Beatles are, you know, they're, they're all really good <laughs> intermediaries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of variables there. Well, and they, and. But it's also a guilt trip if you happen to not be already enlightened in any way, if you're not one of, if you're not already. If you don't know what you're doing in the ritual, which or, most people don't. Well, the ritual to me could be unconscious if you're in. It's like music. If if you're if you're totally in, inhabited, you know. If if you're totally absorbed into the uh, into the to the performance, mm -hmm. then uh, <clears throat> being conscious is kind of it would get in the way. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's all my, it is kind of getting away because I mean I, I can't sing the Navy hymn without it being numinous to me, mm -hmm. and without you know just turning into a bucket of tears mm -hmm. because there's so many numinous things throughout my life that have been associated with the Navy hymn that mm -hmm. I can't even begin to talk about it, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if you saw my talk, but uh, over here at the Naval Academy, no. mm. do, you, do you know what the, na the number of the Navy hymn and the hymnal is? No. It's 808. And when you go in the Naval Academy, no matter what else, I mean, if they may have taken down all the hymns from the placards on the sides of the chapel, but there will always be 808 on that, on that placard that mm. tells you what hymns to look at. Always, you'll find eight zero eight there, whether there's five hymns or zero or one. Uh, and do you get the significance of the symbolism of that? Eight zero eight. Yeah. Well, what? Huh? It's lost on me. Okay. Well, eight eight is the symbol for infinity on its side, right. and zero is a symbol for wholeness. Mm -hmm. And so, it's the symbol of the, the world, or us, mm -hmm. or every you know everything together, mm -hmm. and then infinity around it. So it's a very, very, very powerful symbolic number, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was picked intentionally. It's not that way in every hymnal, but it is that way in the Naval Academy hymnal, mm -hmm. the one that they have over there. And I just I thought. I mean, I got shivers when I realized that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautifully written, beautifully structured musically. It's also the British Navy hymn. Um, and uh, I cannot play it without having a numinous experience, a profound musical, because it's mm -hmm. shaped my life. Mm -hmm. Being born and brought up in a Navy town, a British Navy town, mm -hmm. I've sung it man and boy mm -hmm. and it's a stirring melody it's right a, it's a it's a, much like the national anthem it's extremely moving oh this gets me far more than the national anthem mm -hmm. actually <laughs> I mean, the national anthem gets me also but but not like this i mean i i almost can't talk about it 
people without getting choked up. Well, the hypothetical, the hypo, the uh, I mean, uh, no, I mean the um, rhetorical conversation of the text of the national anthem is what always gets me. Because the big answer at the end of the national anthem, <coughs> if it wasn't rhetoric, is no. That's what the answer is to right. the national anthem. It's no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or not yet. Anyway, at best, it's not yet. <coughs> well, it, it's interesting that I, I don't know. Are you aware that the National Symphony Orchestra has, for decades, maybe four or five decades now, proposed that the national anthem be changed from the Star Spangled Banner to America the Beautiful? And and um, and they the National Symphony Orchestra will always play the America the Beautiful. God save the Queen. No, that's something else. That, that's that's my, my country, country tis of thee. Oh, okay. <clears throat> right. But America the Beautiful is narcissistic, essentially. Yes, but it, but at least it's talking about a peaceful, <clears throat> lyrical scene rather than bombs bursting in air, right? Rather than the, the militaristic. Yeah, I'm uh, going to throw all these lyrics in my head right now. <laughs> yeah. But I, I thought it was very interesting yesterday, so yesterday when they began the ceremony at the beginning of the Super Bowl, they played America the Beautiful first, and then they sort of segued into the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, and that, that was quite interesting and unique also. Might be a good idea in America right now to <laughs> play sort of a unifying melody. Oh, it would be good, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we definitely need that. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So does anybody have any comments about Paul Bruch's essay before I start to tear it apart? Or talk about um, it? I wouldn't tear it apart because it's sort of the essence of Jungian psychology in 30 pages, but... Uh, but. Well, I, 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 you know, my response to having read it was that, you know, my usual thing was spirit, and that's since Jung didn't really organize anything around the idea of spirit, he doesn't either, so he leaves it out. So in a, in a way for me, it's sort of like there's a little gaping hole here. Otherwise... Um, well, what, if explain I explain that, what, what is the gaping hole to you? Well, I'd almost, I almost have to tell you what I think, and I don't want. To. <laughs> and you don't want to tell us what you think. Well, okay. Uh, it's um, you know, he talks about soul, but he and he and in this thing is kind of irritating because he says the spirit of the soul. Well. And spirit is often used a lot of times like school spirit, so it's like this energy. And it's also, he's talking about zeitgeist, so it's that's sort of a, a spirit too, you know, the spirit mm. of the times. Right. And, and it really bothers me, he says, spirit of the soul, because the soul, in my world, in my world, spirit and soul are like polar. Are polar. Really? Yeah, because, uh, and in religion, you know, I've always bothered me about religion that, that they could never seem to organize it and get it straightened out. They'll just use them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like if I said um, everything's an archetype without acknowledging that there are stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So there's an inner understand. there's an inner patterning, an inner structuring, and there's an outer structuring. And he does talk about from within and from without. Mm -hmm. So, in my world, the spirit is what comes from without, and the soul is what comes from within. Mm -hmm. And so you've got and these, you, these you two. Don't, you don't think of spirit as coming up through, out of the soul, having its origin in the soul? Why does the soul need more energy? It's already a source of energy in itself. Yes, it is. But, it, but that source of energy has to somehow be expressed out. Well, certainly, and that that's where you, that, so you've got your archetypes that are uniquely expressed because you're a unique being, so there's a, um, 
here's where I go to Gnosticism and talk about pleroma. Yeah, and, that's right. Yeah. But that's anyway, right. you, you're a unique human being. And so your expression of soul, which is this, there's this sort of universe of soul of which you are a certain channel, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to channel that soul in a certain way, and you're going to interact in this social environment of other souls, and certain stereotypes will be developed. So you've got a patterning going on out here, and you've got a patterning going on here because one each they're reflecting back and forth. Mm -hmm. And what was your question? Is the patterning developing the spirit? Uh, this uh, is the patterning well no, everything sure, everything sure comes from the soul mm -hmm. but there's there's a reflection back it's just like saying what's first the sun or the moon man or woman I mean each reflects back and forth so the to, soul might be where the, the sunshine shining out but without the reflecting back, the sun would never know it existed. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would be non-existent. So you can't really have the, the, the soul without the spirit. So anyway, it sort of bothers me that he... he there's, there's little gaps in there in my mind because he's, he and Jung both do it. They sort of wash over the idea of, of, of spirit and focus everything in on soul which is true, but like I said, you can't really have soul if you don't have spirit. Or you, you can't have from within if you don't have from without, if you want to avoid those terms. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to have energy between the two. Uh, yeah, well, you, which that's where you... Which is how I take the, the spirit to be. I mean, I, I take the spirit to be, um, you know, like the Holy Spirit would be... See, I don't have any religion, so that's... Well, you don't have to be re that religious. I mean, I'm not that religious, notwithstanding the fact... But, I mean, I don't have, really have those metaphors to work with. with yeah, but, I mean, I see, I, this, me. <laughs> I see the soul as a foundation, as I see the archetypes as an unconscious foundational rut, <laughs> you know, a, a riverbed, well, okay, but then... That's then, our animal nature, you know. Right. And, but then, but that's a dry riverbed, and so your life puts water through that riverbed, mm -hmm. right? And that's spirit. Um, you know, you can't. Uh, well, I, I, I could sort of agree with that, and I think that fits into what I was talking about. Right. Okay. I mean, scientists can't explain life. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, how can they explain the difference between life and consciousness? You know. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's a. One of, one of my followers on Twitter, um, and by the way, if you want to know, my Twitter handle is skip underscore conifer, at skip underscore conifer. But uh, one of my followers on Twitter um, says, engineers don't have a life, and they can prove it mathematically. And <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> uh, 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 this is... I mean, th this is exactly the, my fundamental point. Coming over here, I was listening to this conversation between Paul Verveke and Paul Vander or John Verveke and Paul Vanderclay. And uh, if you don't know, Paul Ver or John Vander uh, John Verveke, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto, has done fifty count them, 50 one-hour professionally produced um, videos on awakening from the meaning crisis. Okay, and so what he's done is he's taken meaning as discussed from the beginning of time, from 400 years B.C. up to the present day, but he's basically defined it. And, but... The meaning that he means by the title of his series isn't that. You can't, it's not a dictionary definition. That's logos. But the meaning of your life has to come from your life. It comes from the arrow side of your life. Yeah. The spirit comes from the arrow side of your life. The well, the spirit is moving your life, yes. Well, the there spirit is needs the context, as you say. It needs, it needs, it needs, the rubber needs to hit the road. 
something has to reflect the light or nothing's seen. <laughs> but experience uh, is the key to meaning. There yeah. is, anytime you're not experiencing something, there is no meaning. You can talk yeah. about it forever and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, this means so and so. Well, that's right. Right. <laughs> Nancy. Did you want to come in? No, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but you do agree with me that an engineer doesn't have a I life. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> can prove it mathematically. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> okay, this is the classic misunderstanding, which is that. And this applies to almost all theologians and to essentially all philosophers who are rationalists, okay? <clears throat> Rational, I mean, the point of this book, right, this book, the red book, is that there are two sides to the equation. There's rationality, and then there's irrationality. And... You, ha you can't have one without the other you, there's, because it's because of the duality that there is psychic energy. Okay. And so what... Pardon me. No? I'm watching this eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just listening. <laughs> okay. So, so um, so most theologians follow John 1.1, 1, 1, which says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But, no, you know, if you have a Bible, you have a, a black doorstop, unless you put life into it. Otherwise, it's just a, it's just a black book. And, and what is the purpose of it? You have to put life into it. And so, you know, gifted theologian can put life into it, no doubt about that. But, um, but it's still a doorstop unless you engage with it. Precisely. And when you engage with it, it becomes a projectile or something even better. Or a weapon, I a guess. Weapon. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you're weaponizing this. <laughs> right, but but when it becomes a weapon like the fundamentalists use it, every word of the Bible is true. Yeah, they thump on the Bible, right? By, it says so right here. But, <laughs> yeah, it says so right here. But but the point is that um, you know unless it speaks to you, it, it's nothing. Yeah. That's where I get to the, one of the variations on the myth of Persephone is where Hades goes up and, uh, you know, abducts Persephone. Mm -hmm. And the whole point there is, here's this guy that lives in, in hell, in, in, in death, and you could say, that's your black book. It's, it's, it's your language, it's anything. Mm -hmm. You have to go find meaning somewhere, so he goes and gets the daughter of life and pulls life into it, and that gives it meaning. And that's right. That's that gives hell nothing. meaning because who cares about hell unless perception? Well, it gives stolen. death. It gives the dead things meaning that you would have around you, like black books that are doorstops. If you didn't go, put some mm -hmm. life in it. Precisely. Um, and so anyway, um, Verveke did these fifty essay or fifty videos on the meaning crisis, and he completely missed the point because the me meeting isn't in the logos. You can say any number of words and uh, you can say any number of words and they won't mean necessarily anything. Uh, and you know, certainly what Descartes uh, said, cogito uh, ergo sum, you know, isn't, isn't dispositive. I think therefore I am. Whereas, uh, what, what did Gritsch say it was, it's, um, what? In here? Yeah, he said in uh, something in, in anima, uh, something in anima. I'll get to it anyway. He, anyway, the point is that, that life is in, in the meaning and in the, in the 
transcendence. Um, right. Sorry, I don't I don't have the quote right at my fingertips. Ah, here it is. Essay in anima. Being is in the animation of the of your being. Okay, whether it's anima or animus, that's that's a picky picky point. But being is in anima. It's not. I think, therefore, I am. It's. That's interesting because that's basically saying being is in, being unconscious, <laughs> being being engaged in a way where you're not interfering with 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 cogito. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and the point the point is that we have to have balance between the two. Ultimately, that's the point. But the other thing is, for example, playing an instrument, he's totally unconscious of what he's doing, and yet he's creating through a structure. So if you're painting and you're, sure. you're creating through a structure, so the structure doesn't have to be cogito in the sense of mental. It could just mm -hmm. be through your hands or something else. And sensory. Just yeah. Do all yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So, so I heard about Van Cliburn at one point. People asked him how did he become such a virtuoso pianist? Was it because he could memorize the the notes? And he said, No, it's about playing what's between the notes. Mm -hmm. It's not the notes. <laughs> <laughs> right, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's what's between the notes that counts, and right makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so as long as, I mean, it's like a you know a great guitarist or uh, you know all the famous rock and roll singers of, or even the lousy ones like me. <laughs> even the lousy ones. Like, I can get on a roll, and I'm. You're playing guitar. You know, Right. The point is you're animating. Yeah. And, yeah. And not, I'm, I'm just, li I'm totally listening. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, have, I have no idea what I'm hitting anymore. In fact, that's the way I practice. I just, that's how I taught myself. I would just play stuff until I didn't even know what I was doing. I just listening to, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to go through it like that. Right. So and I'm not very good, but when I'm, when I'm good, I'm good. Right. <laughs> And, and that's the meaning of, uh, of anything creative that, you know, I'm not trying to make a wonderful calligraphy here. I'm trying to animate myself, mm -hmm. and, but I'm not, I'm not a great visualizer like Bill is. And so I have to make lots of mistakes before I can get it the way I want it to be. I'm, I'm getting there, but... But well. it's like um, you're listening to James Joyce, truly listening. Yes. He had to get into it before he could do yeah, anything with it. I wonder if it would it. be easier to have someone read that to you, especially the soliloquy. <laughs> you ever heard the soliloquy you read to you? Yeah, well, yeah. That's, that's what you have to do. Everybody has to do this. Go immediately on YouTube and put in Molly Bloom's soliloquy into the search and, you, and to, you'll to, find at least really well. three wonderful Irish actresses mm -hmm. that have um, that have performed yeah. Molly Bloom's soliloquy mm -hmm. and it's just well it's it's raunchy as hell but it's also mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. transcendent mm -hmm. in many ways transporting yeah. transporting and transcendent <laughs> and, you know, as, as said, maybe the devil's grandmother knows so much about a woman, but I, I didn't. <laughs> but, I mean, even for Jung, he couldn't get into it until he could get into it. You know, it's like, it's like okay, I'm, I'm young, I'm going to learn how to do a a saxophone solo with a jazz band and I'm going to spend the next three years learning saxophone music and 
and going ba ba, you know, whatever with my saxophone. And ultimately, I can get to the point where I don't have to look at the music anymore, as you as you say. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's there was so much invention going on in, in the arts then, especially in the literature. And I think it's very difficult because it, it foregrounded so much what is normally transparent, you know. So you're you're suddenly seeing you're seeing the words or you're seeing the notes, you know, and you're not seeing between the notes because mm -hmm. you can't experience it yet. It's mm -hmm. just so what <laughs> it's so jarring. Yeah. And so that's what all these trials on this calligraphy are. So my calligraphy teacher called me up and reminded me that I have a class tomorrow at, at Anne Arundel Community College on calligraphy. Please? Yeah. And, um, and she doesn't know what she's in for, probably. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Um, One of Birch's key points here is that he that Jung was seeking to refer to the soul in its original primal state as a mysterious and extremely powerful reality. And so, you know, when you're doing um, collage, mm -hmm. as long as you have to think about doing collage, you can't do it. It's only when you do it that you can do it, right? And so as long as I have to think about doing a calligraphy, um, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it, but I also don't have a visioning capability, so I have to try it a lot of different ways and see which wor what, what works, which right? Which is the premise of that wonderful series of books, Zen, and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah. That one's, that's a, an old one. <laughs> I haven't seen that one in a while. Right. Arrogant. And then there's... Um, so, uh, some of the quotes that I like in here, that he's, he's quoting Young now, he says, The spirit of this time has condemned us to haste. Uh, we need the life of eternity um, because we're the bridge from the past to the future mm -hmm. and so we have to understand that that's what we are mm -hmm. and, um, and how do we do that? Well, we do it by patching together a life like a collage, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, and so, you know, here I've done collage, right? So originally I had this idea, sort of didn't really work too well. Okay, so originally I had that idea, but then later on I had this idea, which is sort of zeroing in on it, but I made the dragon too big, so now I have to go back and redo it again. But I mean, here's a here's a version of it that's sort of cool. Okay, the only problem that, with it is I didn't. I decided not to put the and as part at the horns as part of the and. That was the main thing I didn't like about that. And the, these weren't finished pieces. I was just trying to get something down so I could see what it looked like from a structural point of view. And when I started this, I had no idea how to draw a dragon. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to draw a dragon and a devil. Right. Or a version. <laughs> or a version of them, yes, or, or a version of them. I know how to, how to do it. And so, um, so, I have this, oh, okay. This is where the quote came from. It came from page 232 of the, re of the folio edition and from, in the reader's edition, page 130. And that's 
that's where this quote came from. My friends, it is wise to nourish the soul, otherwise you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. And, you know, boy, do I ever see that around me, everywhere. And, you know, that that's the beauty of your Messiah, that you're, you're nourishing the soul of everyone when you're, when you're getting them all to play their parts. And, and, uh, and unite. And unite. And, and acknowledge that alienation is mythical. Alienation is a weapon of the enemy, and it's a myth. We are not alienated. I have to say, and I, I love that, um, was it Denise last week, or we were talking about that the, we had that shared experience of being mm. one with everyone. That profound experience of being one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This was at our meeting last month. Oh, that reminds me of, um, I forget the woman, but you and someone else. Uh, yes, I'm talking about Denise. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, so, um, okay, what was that? Was it month? Denise? Was that, was it? Yeah. The I mean, New Year's mm -hmm. experience, okay. So one of the things we have to remember is that I, I'm trying to root out masculine and feminine as words that we use. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we, everybody uses masculine and feminine as a duality, but the reality is that we're all partially masculine and partially feminine. And Dr. Young's position was the most masculine man from an outer point of view is the most feminine internally and vice versa so it's it reminds me of this they were doing an interview and I, I forget what this was this was years ago but it really stuck it's like we had the marlboro man there you know this 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 mm -hmm. cowboy and this this woman comes up and she asked him about his inner feminine and he <laughs> i don't got no inner feminine you know feminine yeah. <laughs> he was just like oh, you silly little <laughs> Billy. <laughs> right. It just it was just incredible. But, I mean, he was he was very much a man. <laughs> yeah, well uh, but the but the truth is bullies are Well he wasn't a bully, he was yeah. just he was he was very sure of his manhood. <laughs> yeah. And not too flexible with the concepts. He didn't want to. He, he didn't want to entertain anything like that. Yeah, he was protesting too much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But every time I see the national ad with the guy with the really deep voice, a big guy with the deep voice, <laughs> say, you know, but you know, rent your car, at national, blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God, this guy must be a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so any, anyway, what Jung was talking about was that on the masculine side is, is this um, instinct toward perfection. Yeah. He was referring to it as masculine in his day. And this instinct toward perfection, whereas the feminine side is seeking wholeness. Okay, And so men live in the logos all day long, okay? Everything here mm -hmm. in this room was made by the Logos. This hypothetical man you're talking about. Yeah, hypothetical <laughs> man. But, he, but God, I think I could kill myself if I lived in the Logos all the time. Yeah. Um, but, he, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're writing something, Logos means word. Mm -hmm. And again, you're just making a bunch of words that you know, don't really, nobody's going to buy it, right? In most cases, I mean, I, I've sold a, exactly 167 copies of Political Psychology mm -hmm. since 2014. <laughs> so nobody's going to buy your work. Right? <laughs> but, um, but the feminine side has always been responsible for keeping the, the civilization and the family together, right? But um, <sighs> well, then he goes on and talks about um, perfection and, and uh, 
completion and the idea that the, uh, well it has to be balanced right because the paragon of perfection is a monster that's what he says in in paragraph 621 of the red book the the paragon i mean that's i think i think that's where we are now we're in the last throes of the whole patriarchal masculine uh, the ideals of perfection and and um, Accumulation, winning, winning is the yeah, big but you thing. Don't have, win everything. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't, you don't have a life though. I mean, it's like, okay, so or, or what all, kind of life is that? Can you imagine? You know. Yeah, I, I barely looked up at the Super Bowl yesterday. Honestly, I mean, I, I was, I, I had it on. <laughs> and, I haven't seen but, the Super Bowl in fifty years or whatever it's been. Yeah. On. <laughs> well, I, 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 I saw the three Kansas City touchdowns. Because they got my attention with the first one, and then boom, they well, you know, I had the two more. Forty Niners win. What's his name was out there? That really in the eighties. That really good quarterback, uh, Joe Montana. Joe Montana. Mm -hmm. I thought that guy's cool. I don't know why. His name probably. Maybe right. he smoked a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know, those are the those guys are the only guys that are having an authentic experience. Yeah. And meanwhile, everybody else is just sitting well, there eating same popcorn. With bands on a stage, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most of the people are out there doing something else. Yeah, vicarious experience, not a, not yeah. a true yeah. experience, yeah. right? And and so, and the men who have been building things or whatever it is all week in their jobs come home, and what do they do? They stare at the TV where they're again having a vicarious experience, while the women are creating a party or, yeah. you know, holding the family together or making the meals, which are all life. Having relationships with short people. You know. Yeah, and, and that's right. <laughs> yeah, having relationships. <laughs> and, you know, we really need balance because maybe there's a woman out there that likes football, right, and would like to see these big clunks clunk, <laughs> clunking against one another. Uh, okay, so anyway. Concussions. Yeah. yeah, concussion city. Instead of completeness, one strives for perfection. That's this masculine idea. Instead of authenticity, one seeks for exclusivity. Uh, instead of being creative from within oneself, one aims for the unreachable ideal. Jung recognizes in the heroic tendency with its incapacitating and self-alienating approach. And so the point is that, you know, we, we need logos. We need it 100% because everything here, including our bodies, was created as a structure. I think of that as a skeleton, mm -hmm. right? And so our DNA is a logos because it produces us in a specific way but it's, it's like the skeleton of our being, but it isn't our being, right? Our being is something else. It's a spirit. That, do you object to that? Our being is what? Our life. Our being includes our spirit. Well, okay, so the thing is, Okay, let's say that let's say the DNA is logos, okay, because I think we need a dictionary. No, no we don't. <laughs> I need better logos. <laughs> right. Okay. So so let's suppose that the that the logos of our DNA can produce your body and each one of our bodies and it can it can direct that Every cell in our body is replaced. But I think replaced. that's just our way of thinking about it. I don't think our bodies really have logos in them. Well, it's a kind of it's a logos kind of, has to do with consciousness. It doesn't have to do with being. Okay, so so then what what's life? Okay, if you, we have we have we have either Frank. Wait a minute, I wrote we, this down somewhere. Wait a minute, we have either Frankenstein or Bill sitting here at the table, right? Frank, you know, Frankenstein was put together. You've got all of them, all in, all in one. It's, it's all inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have Bill, but he's just sitting here. Being he's in nothingness. He, he's a, he's a, a produced robot, right? What, 
what makes him alive? What makes data on Star Trek alive? Well, he's an actor, so we know. <laughs> <laughs> he's just faking the break. <laughs> it's just like we are. We're, we're faking that we're... Yeah, but it's not emotion, right? I mean, in no. Star Trek, they they passed it off as emotion. I, life to me is any... Okay, you want? I've got life to find. Go ahead. I, Go for it. I, in my world, life and consciousness are the same thing. So if if you let's say you've got a flower and the sun comes up and the flower fall whatever that's called, uh, mm -hmm. heal, whatever you know the flower feels there's the There's a kind sun. of a consciousness. There is right? definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty simple, and it so there's there's a life now. A rock probably doesn't do a lot of anything on its own. It just sits there. Though I think in terms of galactic, you know, time spans, that rock probably is doing something. Well, that's not what the alchemists thought, Bill. Well, that's the stone. That's, that's... There's that's, a difference between a rock and a stone. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> between between, a, a, rock, rock between a rock and a stone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, God, help me. I'm glad I had a little one. <laughs> Bill, do you think that our consciousness is just reflexes? Because I think that you know, the flower, what the flower is doing in turning to the light, is a reflex. Why? Well, isn't that? Um, well, a reflex is it's sort of like you you've just introduced another word, but I don't know that it's any different than the or. <coughs> not included in or anything else how would you distinguish a reflex from life because you're not going to have a reflex if there is no life and you're not going to have you can have life without reflexes well I'm thinking about suicide I mean not actively but um, oh, that's I, I think about it all the time <laughs> go go ahead I grasshopper mean, <laughs> why it has nothing to do with it's anti-life isn't it if I was responding, if everything in my being was responding to the nurturing effects of those around me, I would never kill myself. But we know that at least one soldier kills himself every single day. Twenty-two. Twenty-two kill themselves every single day. Either actual or former. Well, you know, that's a tough one because I don't think there's any one answer. Yeah, you know, I think um, suicide also takes many forms. Alcoholics, mm -hmm. that's basically... And self-destructive <coughs> behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. But, um, you know, I remember being asked by a psychiatrist, or a psychologist, or both, um, do, you ever, do you have thoughts of suicide or of hurting yourself? And I go, um, I don't know. And if I did, what I, why would I tell you? <laughs> it's sort of like <laughs> I got gonna. What am I got? Hey, I'm gonna kill myself. You know, what? <laughs> you know that makes no sense to me. So it never has. I've often, I've been asked that a few times. And well, I mean, psychologists always always ask if you have suicidal ideation, and. I've never had psychotherapy, but yes, I have had suicidal uh, ideation. But, sometime. but, and you know, in 2008, when the market crashed and everybody lost everything, um, you know, I lost everything, and um, you know, it went up to the roof and it was only one story. No, <laughs> no, I, I, but I mean, but the same thing happened with my neighbor, and my neighbor was. Um, was the founder of, um, well, I'm not going to tell you which nursery, but a very popular oh, nursery. Yeah, we're not going to mention names here, but they're in our area. There's a very successful nursery that everybody goes to. And the founder of that nursery, when the 2008 crash happened, he went out in Lake Ogleton and shot himself. You know, and you know, I, I kept saying, okay, well, he shot himself, and, you know, I'm in the same circumstance. Um, you know, I want to find out how this comes out. 
you know, I don't want to just give up. I want to find out how it comes out. And so it comes out as, as this now. Okay, the last few years I've been doing this, but... How do you know you're not just being, you know... You're, you're, you're talking about robots. We're just basically programmed to, uh, to carry forth... To be reborn. Yeah, that? to be reborn. Well, I, I mean, I was reborn. reborn. I was defeated. I mean, this is Joe Archetype. I was, yeah, yeah, I you, was just, in a well. contest for my, Be for my life savings. I lost. I lost everything, and it could I, just be all reflexes that keeps you alive. And if you realize that, it would be totally pointless to be alive. Then you might want to just finish yourself. But, but you if like, that's all you've got, I guess that's. Yeah, but you. I, I like it. It could be that way, but it isn't. You know, it isn't. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you but know, you know, I I could have a, a, a an imbalance. Maybe I didn't take my lithium or something, and uh, you know, I yeah, I go off the edge. And, uh, a lot of people do, I guess, and and it's not really it's not really logos. I don't think the sunflower, I think, is incapable of uh, not following the sun. That makes sense. That's right. You ever see a whole field of them? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I was in Hungary and they, I, you just, really? you'd see a field as far as you could go. <laughs> yeah. That was incredible sight. Yeah, but my, my reaction was, okay, this is pretty crappy. And it was pretty crappy for 11 years, really. And... Um, you know, ultimately, I did lose my home after fighting. I have that sign that I look at every day. Contest, defeat, lament, and get to get stronger. Yes, right. <laughs> and where are you starting at? Good. Uh, yep. Mm. What is that? So, uh, so it's the Joe Barker type. Joe Barker. So, you know, we have to go through this experience every day. You know, door. most people don't realize that that's the, that's the, the way the process works, but it did. I mean, if you had asked me when I finished my JD or my MBA whether I would ever do anything in psychology, I would have said you were a lunatic, right? Mm -hmm. That's just for crazy people. <laughs> yeah, it's just for crazy people. <laughs> Yeah. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we're we're cra we're nothing if we're not crazy. But I mean, when it came to me, you know, the suicidal ideation, I said, "Well, perish that thought because I I want to know how it comes out. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> skip out on it. I'm gonna." have the full experience and see what happens mm -hmm. and see there's the other side of that you can see what happens by letting yourself go towards suicide and see how far you go oh, Let's talk about <sighs> the adaptation is very interesting I think adaptation <laughs> over the you were talking before about how the rock over you know galactic time changes yeah. we as human beings have evolved over probably galactic time but we have within us because I think of our connection with galactic time we have within us the stardust. adaptive ability to stardust the adaptive ability to evolve in a moment the plasticity allows us to evolve in a moment in the wink of an eye okay I mean I'm here we wouldn't we would not have been as successful as we have been thus far if we, uh, if we weren't. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So in any case the inner opposites are any number of opposites. There are thousands of them. You know, the simplest is masculine feminine, but we we have to stop talking in that way because as soon as we use the word masculine, feminine, or emotion, what we've done is we've immediately put it in the context of, quote unquote, the war between men and women. But that's not what it's about at all, really. Okay, because, okay, women have the burden of, of uh, delivering the next generation, 
Okay, and that may take up 20 years of a woman's life, but in compensation, she usually lives longer than men. <laughs> right? So... That's in a weird way to think about it. No, but, but other, other you than... You were awarded an extra five years. <laughs> of course, your husband's dead. <laughs> Your children all hate you, but <laughs> but but then then he's talking about and in the red book because this is an essay about the red book, right? He's talking about the the divine child being born, and the divine child can be born in him, in in men as well as women, and it's recognizing that God is within us and. You know, there's no God out there in the physical world. You know, where's that? Okay, you, you know, there's no scientist that can give us a, a telescopic or microscopic view of God, right? God we carry within our hearts. And, you know, but no theologian ever told me that. No. Never. Never told you what? never told me that that God and heaven and hell are in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I experienced it once mm -hmm. when my daughter told me I was going to hell. Bang! I went into hell right, right then, right in that moment. And it took me 10 years to find my way out, right? And it's only this stuff that, that got me out of it, right? And... Nothing exists outside of us. Nothing except exists the outside of us. Except the collective, you know, we've, we've got records of the collective. Yeah, we've got, we've got our social mirror. Yeah. You know, we our context. The other, th one other thing, since you talked about, uh, one of the things that bothered me, that he talked about opposites, you bring, you bring up opposites, and, you, and you, you use that a lot, and it's always bothered me, but... I mean, opposites is fine. I've read I read that alchemy book, and I see where he uses it all the time. And I can I can live with it, even though I think it's still very a blunt a very blunt way of looking at things. But on the other hand, being a feeler instead of a thinker, I uh, I would oftentimes substitute where he says opposites with uh, intensities. So I would see you know I would see things in terms of uh, rather than being male and female. Uh, maybe I would say masculine and feminine if I had to use words, but it would be like an intensity of, of, of a, 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 not a feeling, but of a, a of a, a weight of, uh, you know, there's a, some people are more masculine, some are more feminine, and there's this kind of this thing going on like this rather than, oh, masculine, da -da 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 -da, fiddling, da -da -da -da. degrees. Yeah, it, it's 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 like the, gradient. There's a there's a gradient, and well, you, sure you never gradient. really have anything at either extreme. It's always yeah, I know. Right, it's, just, so it's always changing. It's it's not like a teeter totter. So it's more like a bosu. When he says opposites, that's more like a heuristic. <laughs> you know, that's Pardon? that's like a, a way of thinking about it, but it's not the way things yeah, are. I, that's right. It, we need to understand that that isn't the way things are because there are thousands of sets of opposites operating in us at all times. Well, there has to be more than an infinite number Well, at infi any time. infinite number on there both would, sides. There would be no consciousness because we, we, right. we float on top of those things. Precisely. But you it, see that? But the point is... <laughs> well, there's no... Well, if they, I, the way I like to say is differential play of signifiers, which is real philosophical. But you've got all these signifiers all around you, all these things you see, and, and you register them, but you don't necessarily bring them forward. But what you do have forward is resting in all of those other signifiers. So you have, you've got this experience going on exactly. of significations. Exactly. And so it's... Right. So, so it's not pure opposites, because pure opposites would be a teeter-totter, where you just find the balance, mm -hmm. right? You know, if, if you have... If you have mom who's heavier on one end and little, three little kids on the other end, and you set the, the board of the teeter-totter at a certain place, you can balance the two, right? And, but it's not that simple because it's more like a bosu. You know what a bosu is? Okay, so a bosu is a, it means both sides up, really. 
Right, and, yeah. and what it is is it's a balloon on one side of heavy rubber, and on the other side it's a flat board of pla heavy plastic, mm -hmm. right? And so... Fitness balance. Yeah, think of it as a like, balloon. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're standing on a balloon, mm -hmm. and there are all these opposites that are existing mm -hmm. inside that balloon, but there's only one point of balance, right? And you have to find the that point, if you're gonna stand on that BOSU, today I successfully did it for 10 minutes. Okay, can you stand on a BOSU for 10 minutes? Right. I've been able to do it for 60 years. That's a new challenge. It's hard. Okay, and the reason you do it is because it, it fires the muscles in your mm -hmm. trunk, right? But if, if you can stand on a BOSU for 10 minutes, then you're balancing so many opposites, okay, because you're trying to cover your weight and, you know, how inflated the BOSU is and, and uh, what might be happening with the earth. Is there an earthquake right now? <laughs> Whatever it is, okay. <laughs> I mean, there, there are sort of thousands of possibilities or millions or infinite number of possibilities within, within that balloon. Think of it as a balloon and you're trying to get a perfect balance of that balloon with you standing on top of it. Um, that's what it's like. It's not like a teeter-totter, right? But you can only say this metaphorically. And, and so if you can do that, if you can stand on the BOSU, then you get the divine child, okay? <laughs> Oh, I think it's here. <laughs> okay. You got it. <laughs> so the divine, ch Jung says, the divine child approached me out of the terrible ambiguity, the hateful, beautiful, the evil and good, the laughable, serious, the sick, healthy, and the inhuman, human, and the ungodly, godly. Okay, so what he's saying is that there's a symbol that's being produced which represents balance okay and that is divine okay that if you're if you are balanced in whatever it is you're doing then you're there um, many spiritual people say it's a detachment being detached from from all attachments, because attachments it's, it's are going to put you off balance. Right, creation. and so, I mean, with music, if you're playing the notes, that's not balanced, right? Okay. But okay. If, you're, if you're feeling the notes mm -hmm. and executing the notes but not consciously, mm -hmm. you know, it's not you going bang, 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 it's you going, you know, something yeah. very melodic. Because the, music, be because the music is always going somewhere. It's a bit like being on a bicycle. Playing a sonata is like being on a bicycle. Playing the notes by themselves is not balanced. Mm -hmm. But the movement, the projection, the development of the harmonies, where they're heading, is keeping you in balance. The journey is keeping you. Right. Right. And so the examples that I learned about, I mean, at one point I took a uh, weekend on Zen. I happened to be living in Japan, so I wanted to take a, a, authentic. a, a authentic Zen thing. Right. And, and so... <laughs> so Americans have no respect. Well, and, and this this was this was twice irreverent because it was an American that was teaching the class. But it wasn't Tokyo. In fairness, it wasn't Tokyo. Okay, so I simply asked, "Okay, what's Zen?" Okay, and good question. Yeah, Very good. and so his answer was. Well, think of riding a bicycle. As long as you have to balance and steer and pedal, mm -hmm. you can't ride a bicycle. But once you give those things up, then you can ride a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And think about learning to touch type, which we all do because we now all have to have computers. But back in the day when I was in high school in Japan, I had to 
learn to, you know, physically bang, bang, bang out the touch typing. But as long as you have to think about where the A key is, I mean, right now I couldn't tell you where the A key is, but I can type a word without, I, I can type, but I have no idea where the keys are on the keyboard or which fingers touch which keys. And, and so music would be like that. It's, it's like, as long as you have to think about where the A key or the A minor is or whatever it is, um, you can't play the organ, but as soon as you can not think about that, then you can play. And I don't know if you, um, what, Monty Maxwell, do you know Ma Monty Maxwell? Okay, you know, right? Okay, so Monty Maxwell is the head organist at the Naval Academy Chapel. And about 40 years ago, or maybe longer, but I, I don't know, it's been a while. <laughs> anyway, Monty was in the Navy um, band, and he wasn't playing the organ at that time. But he got assigned to the Naval Academy, so he marched up and down playing at a lot of funerals and that sort of thing. And, but he went into the Naval he, he told the story that I went into the chapel, and I saw that organ, and I said, that's my organ. And he got out of the Navy, and he never left. And he's still there, I mean, however many years it is later, it's probably four, more than 40 years ago. And he, you know, he plays that organ. He, I mean, he's the boss of that organ. Yes, <laughs> it is his... But he's not a selfish <clears throat> boss. He's never, he's, he welcomes people. He says, welcome to my home. Yes. yes. Have you ever played that organ? Yes. You have? Mm -hmm. And and he was there watching you. Yes, or? he invited. Uh huh. He invites everybody. Fantastic. And and could you possibly cope with it? No. I mean, I I've. I would want to cope with it. I would want Monty not to be there. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like the cha the chapel to be locked and mm -hmm. no one to be permitted mm -hmm. entry. Because if I thought anybody was making a judgment. I would just stop. You know, I'd be at the door of my ear. And yeah. Have and I'd be stuff. broadcasting on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, and then I go, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I would never. <laughs> and then we get into a different question, which is jargon. And the question of language, sense of language, and sets of contexts. I used to be very nervous on stage until I realized and embody now every time I perform two pieces of knowledge. Number one, nobody else has the music that I have. No one else has it in their possession. So they don't know. Number two, nobody knows how I'm interpreting this music. But my interpretation has a value and validity and I'm just gonna damn well play it. Mm. Nobody will know ever know a mistake. I mean, I, no. I, did, mm -hmm. I didn't hear a single mer mistake in the Messiah. I'm sure you might have heard some, but I never heard it. And that's the case with every interaction, every communication, mm -hmm. every piece of creativity we have. Mm. Yeah. It's our context. Who is it that said, organ. you know, there's never, if if the, something about it, the next if there's a mistake, it's the next note. That's right. Ru, um, I know he yeah, said that. Yeah. The conductor from Israel, what's he called? Yeah. Who who wrote the music? Also, marvelous fellow. But it's like whatever note you hit, if you can find Bernstein. the next one, you're okay. Leonard Bernstein wrote mm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know who Linnell Bowen is? Do you know that name? Okay, so Linnell Bowen was the uh, executive director of Maryland Hall. So uh, one of the stains of Annapolis is that we used to have segregated high schools. So we had a white high school and a black high school. And whenever it was back in the 70s or even 60s, um, you know, it became mandated that there was integration, right? 
And so <clears throat> the result was that Annapolis had to build a new high school that was big enough for the whole community, not only for the whites or the blacks. And so then the question became what to do with the high school, the white high school, or well, both of them really. So the, the black high school became a community center, a senior center, but the, Bates. pardon? Is it Bates? Bates, yeah. Okay. And, and now it's, uh, it's also a set of apartments, but, mm -hmm. um, but the white high school, which is now called Maryland Hall, was turned over to the arts. And so <clears throat> every classroom was given to a different art. And um, so in that building, uh, Maryland Hall for the Arts, mm -hmm. There are classes on every conceivable idea of art. Plus, for a small community, Hamilton, or not Hamilton, but um, Annapolis has only 78,000 people in the city limits. We have about 600,000 in the, in the um, surrounding county. But uh, for a small community, we have a symphony orchestra, a chorale, a uh, an opera company, um, a ballet, and what else? And then all the other arts. And also about six million other people living. In the right. Area. Well, and 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 it's non-trivial because, mm -hmm. like the the three leading prima ballerinas of the of Maryland Hall were prima ballerinas in the Chinese National Ballet. Mm -hmm. You know, so they were serious people, right? I mean, it wasn't just like some They're girl, teaching yeah. Was Are they it? teaching babies? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, and so, um, so anyway, I um, decided I wanted to take up portraiture, and the there's a portrait co-op, and the way it works is that uh, one day of the week, I think it might be Wednesday, um, they set aside three hours. And anybody that's a member of the co-op can come and they can paint a portrait. And a, somebody in the community, it's very often a luminary in the community, will sit for five sessions. So they sit for 15 hours. Okay, so the people that are in the portrait co-op can come and they can paint this person's picture for... Um, 15 hours, okay, which is a fair amount of time to do a portrait. And some of the portraits that come out of it are just remarkable. Okay, but the first time that I went there, and this, and I had, <laughs> had no clue how to paint a portrait, no idea whatsoever. Um, I go in there, and it's the fifth sitting for Linnell Bowen, who was the executive director of Maryland Hall. And uh, so I knew I had only three hours to do what the others had already been working on for 12 hours. And so I started to take this paint, paint and I started to go whack, whack, whack. And I'm using all these greens and purples. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm just, I just let myself go and whatever happened, happened. And um, at the end of it, I look at this. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I just made the executive director of Maryland Hall look like the Grinch who stole Christmas. <laughs> so then Linnell very graciously bought all the portraits, including mine. Wow. Okay. And I couldn't charge very much, but I, I asked, <laughs> no, I, I mean, she, she accepted whatever people asked. Okay. Okay, but I didn't ask very much because I said, my God, I made her look like this Grinch who stole Christmas. So about a year later, I'm peeking in to her office through this blind, and she's got all the portraits on the wall, and my portrait was right in the middle of all these portraits. So I said, well, Linnell, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm gratified that you put this portrait there, but... Um, you know, I'm sorry I made you look like the Grinch who stole Christmas, you know. And, and she says, oh, no, that's my favorite one because th that is exactly how I was feeling that day. Interesting. Isn't that interesting, right, that I unconsciously cued in 
on how she was. I mean, she was sitting there and she was, you know, very kind of tense and so on that three hour period, like she really didn't want to be there that per particular three hour period. And she said, no, that's exactly, that's my favorite one because it wow. captured how I was feeling. That would have been really cool to see her, like, realize that when she saw it, your career. Yes. You know, like, <laughs> well, oh I, I mean, it was really cool when I saw it for the first time on her wall, and I go, wow. <laughs> right. <laughs> How could that be? <laughs> how could it be there in this place of honor? But that that's how... You know, because she was the executive director of the whole shebang, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, she was in, interested in how people, you know, played out their unconscious and did their art. And, um, you know, I keep thinking I want to go back to doing whack, whack, whack with that work. But the problem, is, I, the problem is I've done a lot of portraits, but they're sometimes too honest. They're sometimes too honest, and uh, uh, playing out our unconscious is the key to individuation, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah, I mean we have to be in touch with our unconscious. That's that's the key about what we're talking about here, and and so the this experience of the desert. Um, is that you don't have connection with your unconscious. And so it's like writer's block. Think of writer's block, right? Um, where a writer will have an experience that's transporting. And I had that experience when I wrote my novel. Uh, and I wrote this novel, and I have no recollection of doing it. It came from the unconscious, right? It, it, was a arch archetype that played through me, and so if I was trying to be a novelist, mm -hmm. it would have um, it would have scared me because then I say, yeah, do I really want to go back there? You know. Yeah, I was just thinking, got in the way. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah, your consciousness says, you know, do I really want to be back there? Right. You know, and that's like the alchemist. Yeah, that's right, and it's like what you're you were saying earlier, Bill. Where um, it's the work that you know. It, it, it can't be about trying to make a living, right? Yeah. And and so, for example, all the you know romance novels that people write, they're all of a certain you know formula, and. So if you try to write in formulaic, you know, it, it'll be mildly amusing to people, but it's like the football player who's, or the man who's watching the football game, right? It's, it's vicarious and it's, escape. Escapism. it's escapism and it doesn't really mean to, too much, right? Which is what most of life is, is distraction. Hey, right. The, shop, the economy's going to collapse, you know, remember Bush... Mm -hmm. Don't did stop you, shopping. <laughs> did you ask for commentary on your artwork? No. No. But I, I let people see it when I'm finished. I don't. I don't want anybody to say anything until it's done. Yeah. And even when it's done, do you? Do you? I no. mean, do you hate it when they say, "Oh, that's nice"? Hmm. No, I don't care. I figure. I figure most people don't even know what you're talking about. So. And the people, I've always been lucky because people that I know know what's going on. Let's say I apply for a job, and it's in an art department. Um, I would get the job. I have no art training. I'd get the job uh, because they could see, they, I, I just read Psychology and Alchemy. And I've always my, you know, I've studied art history, and I've done, you know, art history is not really about art. This is this is, you know, this is mostly art. This is mostly design, or this is uh, illustration, or or this, that, and the other. You, you know, it's like I was saying to him. The Pope says, "Come here, put this up there. I want a picture of that." And mm -hmm. so, there's, I'm not going to get totally polar on it, but uh, art and design, 
you could say, it, you know, you, you could talk about those. And if you go to an art department, there'll be art and design. You know, there'll be fine art and design, right? Mm -hmm. Fine art is basically the alchemist. You know, how many people have you heard, especially going through the 60s and stuff, who said, he sold out. You know, that person's not really doing their work. They sold out. They're doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing. And, and the alchemist... Uh, what I was reading in Jung, at least the way he, he talked about it, was those guys weren't in it for the money at all. They didn't give a damn about the gold. And in fact, those were the charlatans. They were, uh, and the process for them, their projection of, of their psyche and, and, and reflecting the, in the work, reflecting back who they were was what was important. And it's the same thing. That's what the fine arts are. They're really, mm -hmm. fine artists aren't uh, if you happen to sell some, which for me would be hard to do, I don't want them to go anywhere. <laughs> so. What kind of art do you express? Well, I've done a lot. Uh, uh, I, I paint. I, uh, I, I did a lot with computers. That's where I got my degrees. Okay. And, and, uh, and I taught um, animation. I mm -hmm. taught... Taught a lot. But it seems to me that going back to your portrait, that everybody, that Lynn, saw your portrait as the only one that expressed her. At and, that time, yeah. And all the others were actually expressing the artists. Yeah. After we shut this off, after we shut this off, I'll show you a portrait that I did, that's on my phone, okay. um, that is simply too honest. And it's a, it, it seems to me that a lot of artists, like the one that the Pope asked to put up in that corner, are just representing something, given their interpretation, rather right. than expressing the sitter. Mm. That's right. Right. But well, that goes to your fifth. But see, that could be hard. Right. Yeah. right. So, uh, let me say one thing, though. Go ahead, I, I'm yeah. not quite as holy as I sounded there, because... When I was in my early 20s, and I was running around Chicago, and I'd be at the Art Institute looking at stuff, carrying my little pad, and I saw an interesting looking young lady. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do your portrait? <laughs> so I was, I was selling something then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you were selling two things, we know what the other one was. Okay, well there's one other concept that I want to get in here before we stop. And that's the ex existential realization of soul-inspired creativity. And there's this quote from Jung that I want to explain here. Is there anyone among you who believes that he can be spared the way? Can he swindle his way past the pain of Christ? I say such a one deceives himself to, to his own detriment. No one can be spared the way of Christ, since this way leads to what is to come. You should all become Christ's. Okay, now, in the church, there's this idea of imitatio Christi, which it means imitation of Christ. But it doesn't mean that we're, we should be taking on Roman people and getting ourselves nailed to a cross, right? But... What it does mean is that once you know what your self wants, what your, what your unconscious, your deep unconscious wants, then you have to see it through. And if you don't see it through, uh, you're going to be incomplete. You won't have completed your individuation. And so Christ, when he would, uh, so in Christ's case, you know, Jung in 1937, during his last visit to the United States, he had a big following, so he had a dinner at the Plaza Hotel in New York City on 59th Street, now belongs to our president. And uh, at that dinner, um, he gave a talk about Christ, and he said, you know, Christ was um, an, or um, an orphan, okay, he didn't know his father. And so he had to have a compensation for that. And so his compensation was that he was the son of God. Okay. And, and, um, 
And so he, he brought that forward through his teachings. But then he came to um, Jerusalem, and he came to the Mount of Olives and knew that he was going to have to be crucified, that he would be killed the next day. And he also had the way to escape it, to not fulfill his, what he was intended to be, okay? He was not, he, he, he knew what he was intended to be. He lived that fully throughout his life. Um, but at the end, in Gethsemane, he prayed to God and he said, do I really have to go through with this? Because he could have escaped, okay? I mean, I've been there. I, I've seen the, the venue where the, these things happen. He could have escaped in that night and, uh, and not be killed, but that would have sort of been the end of his ministry. Um, and, you know, and so he had said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world, it's of another world, right? And so he prays, you know, do I have to go through with this? And that's what he prays three times in Gethsemane. And he has no answer, okay? But the angel comes and um, comforts him, but points out that, I mean, in, in effect, the effect of it is that he realizes that he has to go through it with it in order to be true to himself, to in order to be true to what he was intended to become. And when they say you ha we all have to be like Christ, that's, that's where individuation comes in, that we all need to search for what we were intended to become, given whatever our life is, uh, whatever that is, you know, whether rich or poor, you, you name it, but we have to see it all the way through. Um, and, and so that's what he did, and that's what Jung means by we should become Christ. We have to understand our fate based on, you know, what our gender is, what our place in the world is. I mean, all of us have won the lottery ticket because we were born in the United States or the UK. And so, you know, we have the best lot of anybody in the world. You know, if you're born in Central Africa, you don't have the kinds of opportunities that we have had. And so if you have that fate, then how do you make that meaningful? How, how do you make your life meaningful? And you have to see it through, whatever it is. And that's difficult, mm -hmm. okay, because of the opposites. This is why the cross to Jung represents, you know, the opposites left and right and heaven and hell, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's what it represents. And, uh, and so, you know, Jung's point was that, that Christ was the perfect God-man because he did what God required of him, and therefore he found his way through to, the, to immortality. And who can deny that he's not immortal? He's sitting here at this table tonight, right? And, and so we all have to do what he did, which is live out our lives. And, you know, we all have difficult lives for one reason or another. Everybody does. That's the way it is to be a human. And um, if, you, if you don't, then you make it that way. <laughs> well, that's right. And, and so this meaning crisis is these, these professors who, who can't get around the meaning crisis. I mean, you can't teach a kid Schopenhauer and expect him to get it, okay? Because that's not what it's about. It's not about learning a bunch of philosophers over the last 2,000 years, and, that, and that's going to inform what you're going to be in your life, right? It doesn't, do, it doesn't work that way. I see the student with Schopenhauer. What does he mean women are like cattle? 
<laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Go to the next chapter. <laughs> yeah, but but that's the point. You're not going to live your life like Schopenhauer or Kahn or any of these other jokers had in mind, or Jung for that matter. You have to live your life according to your insight into what you were meant to be based on where your where you are on the earth. What? Your potentials. Your potential. Can right. Can you just give me the title again of what you were referencing, the existential and mystical? The, the, this one? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is from... Um, Okay, so the quote. Wait a minute. I'll give you the. I'll give you the actual. Uh, the quote is from Ibid, the Red Book. Okay, it's from the Red Book, page two hundred and thirty-four. Okay, I'm not sure whether that's the Reader's Edition or the Folio Edition. Okay, but on the play on the on the Dropbox, there's both. Okay. So in the, oh, well, we might be able to find it because I have my reader's edition here. But in any case, the quote is, is there anyone among you who believes he can be spared the way? Can he swindle his way past the pain of Christ? I say such a one deceives himself to his detriment. No one can be spared the way of Christ since this way leads to what is to come. You should all become Christ. It's and so that's what we do. I mean, all of this stuff we do is distraction. Right. And and yeah. so you know, so the point is when you're going through Football school yeah. and going to university, you're learning how to be a human being. Okay, we're born as wild animals. We imitate our parents and in school we're learning how to be a human being and to live in this civilization that we have here. <laughs> but when you get it to the end of school, now we have all these kids who are nihilists because they don't understand that we're actually problem-solving creatures and your education has been about learning how to solve problems in different intensities and in different environments but then you have to grow up and be a real person okay then you have to be a mature individual and you're going to make mistakes you have to make mistakes and when you make mistakes, then you have to go, you have to continue on. And, and you can't stop. And you're going to be problem solving until the end of your life, every one of us. I mean, I, because I'm aware of this, I'm aware of all these problems I'm, sol- I'm solving every single day, you know, from the time I get up in the morning till I go be- to bed at night. And we all do that, okay? And that's what being a mature human being is about. Regardless of your environment, whether it's solving here. and creating, those that pardon solving and creating problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, solving and creating problems, true. I call them chores, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fortunately, it's not a chore for me to be here. But I'm like the Zen master. I go in and do my dishes, then I go over and do the ah, laundry, yeah. then I go over and <laughs> hey. vacuum the living room. You're just in the flow, right? I am. Okay, so that's what I am and when I'm, old. I'm I doing one of these. <laughs> okay, so this has been the 159th meeting of this group since 20, 2016. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you look at the usage afterward on YouTube, it's quite interesting to see how there are many people who, you know, you'll see, okay, 60% will drop off in the first minute. Okay, they'll, they'll look at it. <laughs> oh, Bill's there. And, and they'll look and, and they'll say, I'm, I'm out of here. But invariably, there'll be 10% that are still there at the end. And... And so when that's 300 people, that means 30 people people. who are really paying attention. That's great. That's right. And so anyway, I hope your your, uh, uh, collage continues well. And um, if you just wait one minute, I'll show you this portrait. Okay, I'm going to excuse ourselves here.